So. I'd like to call this special general issues committee meeting to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the city of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the city's website. Other individuals and the media may also be audibly and or visually recording this meeting. As well, a reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we do have several changes. Delegation requests from Victoria Gelly, Green Party of Ontario, respecting item 7.1, the Green Enbridge Gas Inc. leave to construct application for 2021 Dawn to Parkway Extension and Integrated Resource Planning Proposal. As well, Keith Bolton from Enbridge, Enbridge Gas is here respecting the same matter. One more delegation from Nicole Smith, Kumon Hamilton West, respecting item 7.1. And we do have an added piece of correspondence from the NCA that has been added as item 3.2. Thank you, Madam Clerk. On the agenda, Councillor Clark. It's for the benefit of my colleagues. So the white document that's been circulated by the clerk uh, was the motion that was uh, approved last night unanimously by the Hamilton Conservation Authority. And I thought it was pertinent so that you should all see it before we make any decisions today. Thank you. Thank you. So on the, <clears throat> on the agenda, may I have a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek. All in favor. Declarations of interest, are there any declarations of interest on this uh, agenda? Seeing none, thank you. Item three is the correspondence. So there was, um, just going back to the agenda. The recommendation would be to receive and refer it to the consideration of item 7.1. There was correspondence from Nancy, Nancy Blackborough respecting Enbridge gas fracture pipeline and also 3.2 is the motion from the MPCA to be referred to consideration of item 7.1. I don't have any action on that, is that, nope. Just to, re just to a mover and a seconder, there's no electronic vote. Okay, so moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Pearson, all in favor? Carried. Carried, thank you. Item four, delegation requests. So we have the two delegation requests from Victoria Galea and Keith Bolton. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the delegation requests? So moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Ferguson. All in favor? Thank you. Delegations. Item 5.1, Nicole Smith from Cumon Hamilton West End respecting item 7.1, the Enbridge Gas Inc. Leave to construct application for the 2021 Dawn to Parkway Extension and Integrated Resource Planning Proposal. Nicole Smith, would you please come down to speak to item 7.1? Do we have a five minute time limit on these? Yes. Nicole, and just a reminder that uh, for all our delegations this afternoon, there's a five minute time limit.
Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Councillors, Hamiltonians. Um, let's just see if I remember how to use this blessed thing. There we go. Um, so um, I had uh, prepared this beautiful um, delegation, at least I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> um, but uh, after I sent it to um, uh, the, the clerk and um, uh, I realized that they, there was a beautiful staff report that I hadn't seen, I reviewed that and I, I changed my presentation quite a bit. So I just wanted to have this, this image because this is really what it's all about. It's about the, the natural beauty and the protected wetlands that we don't want impacted. Uh, I was going to talk about why fracking is so problematic uh, and about how huge the swamp is and how important it is to the environment. I was going to go into more details about how wide the right of way was and the additional easements that were required and um, the fact that um, the pipeline is not going to be benefiting us in Ontario um, and it will set the stage for a lot of pollution here. Um, particularly disturbing, I just want to comment that according to Enbridge's own data, between 1999 and 2010, the company had 804 spills. That's a lot of spills, so um, striving for zero spills isn't really that encouraging in that light. Um, but what I really want to talk about, because the, the main issue here is, I believe, whether or not the council is going to be an intervener, and I really think it needs to be. Um, the main reason I think the council needs to be an intervener in this is that you can't ask questions if you're not the intervener or one of the interveners. And I really think that the council has a lot of excellent questions to ask. I was very impressed by the staff report uh, that I read last night, and I think they did a good job on it on many of the points, they certainly made it clear that from many standpoints, there were a lot of issues that had not been thoroughly enough examined and really answered by Enbridge. And so I think that, if anything, much more time needs to be taken to examine those and to really answer all of those questions from all the different departments. Um, Don McLean also made an ex excellent point um, in his, his message yesterday that there's no rush to make that decision about being an intervener or not being an intervener, so there's no, no reason, to, reason to rush to make it. Um, really, what needs to be done is just to, to send the written comments to uh, the OEB, which have been so beautifully, again, done by staff. And uh, I particularly appreciated in the staff report the, the specific mention that we are in a climate emergency and the city has set as its goal to be down to net zero by 2050. And so in that light, to build now in 2020 or 2021, um, a pipeline that's, that's projected to last beyond that 2050 deadline seems to me to be directly contrary to the aims of council and the needs of the city of Hamilton. Um, so we have, a, we have a significant issue here in my mind. Uh, the, a number of areas in the US, in, for example, in New York, uh, which I noticed actually today, the city of New York has decided that it's going to completely shut down and uh, moving forward on anything related to the fossil fuel industry, which I found was just tremendous. Um, so the, the question really is here, if, if New York State and other areas of the U.S. have refused to let this pipeline go through, then why should Ontario allow it? You know, it's really, it's not going to serve Ontario, it's only going to serve the U.S. And the only reason that we're being requested to do it is because they can't get it to go through the U.S. So um, I really feel that, that we're being put in a situation where we're at being asked to make a decision that's not benefiting us, that's going to harm our environment. And just because somebody else said no, it doesn't make any sense to me. I feel it also sets a bad precedent for the future, and we always have to think seven generations in the future. 
not just what's happening now or in 2050, but as our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters have invited us, think far ahead. Thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions for Nicole? Councillor Nan. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just want to say thank you, Nicole, for being here again. Can you, um, if you don't mind, just reiterate why you believe the city should be an intervener or choose to take on our intervener status? Yes, thanks. So it really has to do with being able to ask questions at the hearing. So when you're not an intervener, you can sub submit written comments, but I really believe that there needs to be that live interaction on the part of the city. Thank you. So I'm not seeing any further questions. However, we do not have quorum in the room. Councillor Jackson is up here, my apologies. You're gonna have to come down to vote, Councillor Jackson. Oh, sorry, you can receive from up there, so. <laughs> These millennials. <laughs> I have a motion to receive the presentation. Moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Nan. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Thank you. <laughs> Victoria Galea, Green Party of Ontario, respecting item 7.1, the Ambridge, Embridge Gas Inc. leave to construct application for the 2021 Dawn to Parkway extension and integrated resource planning. Please make your way to the mic. Thank you and hello, Deputy Mayor, Councillors and Representatives. My name is Victoria Galley, and I'm here as a representative of the Green Party of Ontario. Today, I wish to express my serious concern about an application to expand the Enbridge Gas Don Parkway system, which currently sits before the Ontario Energy Board, and the fact that the City of Hamilton needs to be actively involved in this hearing. The recommendation made by the General Manager of Planning and Economic Development that the City should not be involved and should therefore withdraw as an intervener is appalling and should, and for various reasons uh, relating to our climate crisis, the health of our environment, and the unnecessary increase to electricity prices, this application should be denied, and Hamiltonians should have our say. Therefore, my main message to you today is, do not withdraw. First, the project would contribute to a 400% increase in output from our gas-fired power plants by 2025, according to the application. The increase in demand is due in large part to the electricity shortfall beginning in 2022 when the Pickering Nuclear Station starts to come offline. As our provincial government has made the rash decision to cancel 752 clean energy projects at a cost to at least $231 million to the people of Ontario on the grounds that Ontario does not need any additional energy sources. Yet, the plans to ramp up a gas-fired electricity in the coming years directly contradicts these claims, while forcing ratepayers to subsidize the expansion of fossil fuel pipelines. Second, Enbridge admits that it wants to route more fracked gas through Ontario because of the progressive climate policies and public opinion that is limiting pipeline expansion in the US. It also lists the transition to renewable energy and advancements in battery storage as threats to natural gas production. Our city should not become a fracking corridor while other cities and provinces take action on climate change. We should not provide the additional pipeline capacity to expand fracking in our home of Lake Ontario, polluting land and water while accelerating the climate crisis with methane emissions. Third, to finance 204 million construction project and bridges proposing to hike rates for Canadians and consumers by $120 million. There's no reason to build new pipelines that will raise electricity costs when cheaper alternatives exist. Dollar for dollar, electricity conservation programs are less expensive per unit of electricity than any form of new generation. Yet last year, the provincial government abandoned a swath of energy efficiency programs that were helping people to save money by saving energy instead of burning more fossil fuels. The City of Hamilton should push both Enbridge and the province to invest in energy efficient programs to help people save money by saving energy. Finally, the pipeline is proposed to cut through some of the city's most ecologically significant lands, as well as publicly owned properties of the City Hamilton Conservation Authority, to which they oppose. 
namely the Spencer Creek, Bronte Creek, and the Beverly Swamp, one of the largest natural swamps in southwestern Ontario, as I understand you've all seen the HCA decision from last night. In the wake of Coots Paradise 24 billion liter sewage spill that has devastated the local environment, now is certainly not the time to be destroying more of rural Hamilton's pristine and protected natural areas. Councillors, this project is not in the interest of Hamiltonians who will pay the devastating financial and ecological costs of another spill cleanup, as it is not the question of if this pipeline will spill, but when. This project is of no interest to Hamiltonians who will pay more on their electricity bills when we could be saving them money through cheaper alternatives. This project is not backed by the overwhelming climate science that shows us we must stop expanding fossil fuel infrastructure. In 2019 alone, floods, storms, and fires cost the world $150 billion. Approving this project would be fiscally and environmentally irresponsible. Instead of becoming a destination for frack gas, Hamilton should push the Ontario Energy Board to adopt an energy plan that gives priority to energy conservation and low-cost renewables ahead of natural gas. If our councillors sit back quietly while Enbridge forces their way into our protected lands, it does not sound like the same council that declared a climate emergency on March 27, 2019, which details the intent to change the community-wide GHG target from 80% to carbon neutrality before 2050. This necessary and strong target aligns with the recent United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, highlighting the global need to drastically reduce GHG emissions, which is the exact opposite of building a brand new pipeline. I ask you to speak on behalf of Hamiltonians in your capacity as an intervener in opposing the Enbridge application to the Ontario Energy Board. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Victoria Galley, my apologies. Councillor Wilson. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation today. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear in understanding uh, the position that you're putting forward. Um, I think I clearly understood that you're not in support of the recommendation um, that Hamilton withdraw its request for intervener status. I was wondering if you could uh, set out um, more specifically what um, form of participation you do think the city should um, exercise and what role if any your thoughts um, for the city enabling participation of members of the interested community yes so I definitely think that the city should stay on as an intervener as Nicole previously mentioned to be able to ask questions because without our active participation we won't be able to ensure an active response and secondly I absolutely think that the city should impose that we should have members of the interested community involved as well because otherwise you're leaving out important voices of the community that will be directly impacted including the Hamilton Conservation Authority and I think that we have substantial members of the community that would like to represent the community as a whole against the Enbridge pipeline for valid reasons. Okay, thank you. Supplementary question. So how, just trying to get your thoughts then on how best or what mechanisms could the city employ to try and enable interested members of the public to come forward and provide their expertise, um, their opinions, their positions, um, in guiding us on the way forward should uh, we um, reject recommendation A. I think that if you have a open call or anything available online for members of the community to submit their interest and then whether the city chooses from those people or listens to all of the people, I think that you have a large portion of the community that would be ready to immediately stand up um, and on behalf of protecting our wetlands and rejecting the pipeline. It's just a matter of opening that line of communication and I think that thanks to technology, having that open call and forum available online uh, would definitely bring members of the community forward. Thank you. Um, third question, specific to um, some of the comments that have been set out um, by our professional staff in the report. Um, did you wish to comment on anything that may, um, in your opinion, need to be reconsidered or added or subtracted? Uh, I think it, it, 
though I skimmed the whole report, um, I do think it's important that we stay focused on the fact that we as a city did declare, you, you counselors took the time to declare that climate emergency, and I think that um, really putting that at the full front and uh, you know lifting that up as part of your position is important because that proposition is absolutely in no way aligned with uh, opposing, or accepting a pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any further speakers, so I have a motion to receive Victoria's presentation, moved by Councillor Farr, seconded by Councillor Nan. All in favor? Carrie. Carrie, thank you. Item 5.3 is Keith Bolton of, from Embridge Gas Inc. respecting item 7.1, Embridge Gas leave to construct application for the 2021 Don to Parkway extension and integrated resource planning proposal. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Council, staff, uh, stakeholders. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I would have a request at the front end. I know we're limited to five minutes. Um, given this is the primary topic of today is our proposal for this project, I would request if I could speak a little bit longer. Uh, I will move along quickly. Um, I moved for extra time. Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favour? Carried. Thank you very much. I thought I would start off um, just a little bit of... Thank you. Um, I thought I would just start off by a little context setting. Uh, for those of you that aren't that familiar with Enbridge, you would know us uh, previously as Union Gas, serving this community for over 100 years. We did merge with Enbridge uh, last January, so we are now a combined utility, one of the largest in North America. We have uh, 4,600 employees here in Ontario, serving 12 million customers through our 3.7 million customer connections. We have about $18.5 billion worth of assets in this province. And the key to this is our Dawn Storage Hub, which I'll talk a little bit more in a little bit later. One of the most strategic assets that we have in this province is our storage facility down near Sarnia. That is really the heartbeat or the backbone of the natural gas system in this province. It allows us to, to purchase natural gas supplies in the summertime at lower rates, store them and withdraw them during the summer during peak winter times. Each year um, at Enbridge, we spend about a billion dollars in this province in new capital assets, maintaining and upgrading our system, as well as about a billion dollars a year in operating our system. From a longer term perspective, uh, as you think about Enbridge, we are a company that is leading innovation. Uh, you know us as a natural gas distributor, um, historically as Union Gas. However, we have numerous projects where we're looking at low carbon options. There's three primary things that we're focused in on. One is conservation. We've had 25 years of experience driving energy efficiency programs, helping consumers in Ontario lower their energy bills by uh, lowering their overall energy usage as you think about low flow shower heads, thermostats, high efficiency furnaces, things of that nature. We're investing significantly in cleaner technologies like compressed natural gas, um, heat uh, and transportation systems, and electric geothermal systems. Enbridge is in fact one of the largest operators of windmill, uh, renewable electricity power generation in Canada with $8 billion worth of renewable power uh, worldwide. And we're also investing in green power. Uh, we're investing in hydrogen generation using surplus renewable electricity to produce hydrogen and inject into our pipeline system and looking at carbon neutral renewable natural gas from things like landfill and wastewater treatment facilities. Maybe a little bit closer to home here um, in Hamilton. This is a picture of our LEED certified building out in Stony Creek. We have a little over 100 employees that work out of that facility servicing this community. Um, and on an annual basis, Enbridge contributes about $6 million in municipal property taxes to the city. And in addition to that, we invest about $6 million enterprise-wide in community-based programming. So when you think about uh, food banks, shelters, um, local uh, agencies providing services to the community. We obviously want to be part of that community. We live and work here as well. We are very proud sponsors and partners uh, with the City of Hamilton in a number of projects. 
the Hamilton Street Railway is a great example where the city has embarked on converting 120 of your buses from diesel fuel to natural gas, compressed natural gas, lowering your overall emission footprint, and we are a partner in that program. I mentioned energy efficiency earlier. We've been working with, with city housing for over a decade, promoting energy efficiency. In 2018 alone, we contributed $600,000 worth of incentives directly to help improve energy efficiency and overall reduce energy demand. Overall, on the conservation energy efficiency side of things, uh, last, over the last three years, we've contributed $5.5 million worth of incentives directly to Hamiltonians in order to them, for them to lower their overall energy usage. We're also a very proud partner with the city in your Woodward treatment, uh, wastewater treatment facility where we upgrade the uh, waste product um, and inject methane into our system. Um, it's a great opportunity for the city of Hamilton to demonstrate renewable natural gas, putting into the system, essentially then using that in your bus fleet. One of the things we're very proud of is our engagement with first responders in the city working with police, fire in particular, providing training, um, and uh, things like carbon monoxide detector giveaway programs, smoke detector giveaway programs to ensure the safety of our residents. So we believe that natural gas is a great balance between energy reliability, affordability, and the environment. It's a low cost uh, per, uh, energy source, ensuring that both our commercial and our industrial consumers are highly competitive on an ever increasing global market. So let's talk a little bit about the, the project that we have in front of us today. Um, fundamentally, the, the rationale for this project, we're seeing population growth. Between 2011 and 2016, we've seen over one million new residents move to Ontario. These consumers are looking for new housing, places to live, places to work. We're seeing new home construction, new business construction. We're seeing condo development in the GTA, greater uh, Golden Horseshoe area and Niagara regions and all want affordable, reliable energy. This project fundamentally will allow customers at this end of our system to be able to get access back to our Dawn storage hub near Sarnia where they can procure supplies of affordable natural gas. Our Dawn storage hub is a very liquid trading market. It is one of the most competitive in North America and that allows consumers to be able to purchase supplies of natural gas at the most economic price, bringing it through to this part of the province. That facility is interconnected to major pipelines in the United States where we can access supplies throughout North America. It's really important to understand that this new pipeline, 90% of the capacity this pipeline will provide is providing natural gas energy for Ontarians. This is not a flow through pipeline, it is for Ontario. From a longer term perspective, um, there are some things that again, Enbridge is looking at from innovating and creating and procuring supplies of renewable natural gas. We have numerous facilities that we're looking at, uh, working with municipalities across Ontario to harvest uh, methane from landfill. So we continue to look at how we decarbonize our pipeline system and provide Ontarians a great, reliable, affordable source of energy uh, that is increasingly uh, renewable. In terms of some of the technical details of the project itself, as you can see on the slide, this is a new 48-inch uh, pipeline. Um, the construction will occur between our existing facilities, so it's kind of an A to B type of situation where we're going from our Kirkwall valve site to our Hamilton valve site in Carlisle. And as an organization, we are absolutely committed to minimizing the effects of our projects and operations on the environment. As part of the Ontario Energy Board process in applying for this project, we are required to initiate an environmental report that is conducted by a wholly independent uh, environmental expert, which we've done. In addition, we're required to, uh, and we have consulted with affected indigenous communities, landowners, agencies, and obviously municipalities. And we're, con we're committed to continuing that as we go through this project. As you can see on the slide, we did have two open houses for this project. We're open to the public. We advertise those. Um, and we had nearly 70 attendees. This is an opportunity for individual landowners to then have conversations with our experts on any specific landowner issues they may have. The estimated cost of this project is $200 million and will result in an incremental $700,000 in tax revenues to the City of Toronto, or City of Hamilton, pardon, pardon me. In terms of approvals, uh, all large pipeline projects in Ontario are subject to Ontario Energy Board approval. We applied for this project last fall. Um, we anticipate an approval this year for construction next year. 
Let's talk a little bit about the project route. I think that's been of some concern. Um, and so, as I said earlier, we, we have to consult with, or, or um, excuse me, we have to uh, do an environmental report. So we have contracted with Stantec Consulting. And this report fulfills the requirements of the Ontario Energy Board's environmental guidelines for the location, construction, and operation of hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon pipelines and facilities in Ontario. So that report has been completed. And part of that, the purpose of that report is essentially to look at the uh, alternative routes for this pipeline. So what are all the environmental considerations and acceptable alternatives for this pipeline? Determine a preliminary preferred route, engage the public and municipalities and stakeholders in consultation, and ultimately come uh, forward to the Ontario Energy Board with a confirmed preferred route. Beyond that, Enbridge then undertakes a detailed design to determine the exact location of the running line, permanent easement, temporary land use requirements, and road and water course crossing methods. And of course, those, that detailed design is also influenced by supplemental studies, including environmental studies, uh, site-specific requests from landowners and agencies. And in general, this micro-siting, if you will, exercise seeks to avoid sensitive natural and socioeconomic features to the extent practicable. In addition, uh, as I mentioned, we've consulted with the public. Um, and obviously, we work with city staff and, and agencies that are, that are engaged in this, this project. Just to conclude, um, this, is a, this is a project that Enbridge has built many times before. We've had experience just in the last five years in this area with a project in 2015 and 2016. Uh, in this route, we've had pipelines operating since the 1950s without any negative environmental uh, impacts. And we have uh, all the, uh, the understanding that we will be able to replicate that experience with this project. And I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. We have a couple speakers on the list. So questions for the presenter, Councillor Ferguson. Yes, thank you and welcome, sir. And uh, we've had a number of delegations come speak to us um, over the last few weeks about this particular application. So can you confirm for me that the gas that will run through this pipeline actually comes from the U.S.? Well, in fact, the, the gas that comes will come through this pipeline comes from our Don storage facility, which is interconnected to gas supplies throughout North America. So it's Canadian, can come from Western Canada, the U.S., Gulf Coast. So Sarnia is not considered downstream, that's considered upstream? Relative to this project, yes. So we're at the, our, our system, if you think of it this way, starts in Sarnia at our Don storage facility. In the wintertime, pushes gas eastward towards Hamilton. So gas will come the in gas through comes into Sarnia from the U.S., any from Western Canada? Yep, yep, those pipelines are interconnected, so gas may physically flow through the U.S., but it may originate in Alberta. Okay, because the information we've been receiving, it's 100% coming from the U.S. and cutting through Canada to get to the eastern seaboard. Yeah. What, percent, what percentage of the gas is going to be consumed in Canada that's um, going through this, this particular pipeline? 90%. 90%? 90%. Huh. And I will just add... 70% of that is already being consumed in Ontario. It's not net new energy. It's just coming in through more expensive means uh, through other pathways. And I understand this location is an hourglass. So it's a pinch point that you have in your pipeline. That's why you only need to do it was 11 kilometers, whatever the distance is. Is, that's that, is, that, yeah. is that correct information? That, that's absolutely correct. It, it's, it's called looping. So as you think of, think of a pipeline like a straw that has a pinch point in it, you eventually need to add another little piece that goes around that pinch point to add additional capacity. So we call it looping. So you can build the pipeline in, you know, in segments as you go along. And if you're not an expert in this, uh, just say so, but I don't understand fracking. I don't know how it works. Do you? And if so, can you give me a Coles Notes version or fracking for dummies uh, on how this, this technology works? Well, <clears throat> I can't speak, I'm not an expert to the technology. Um, what you're referring to is gas that comes from, uh, from what we call shale gas, comes from a rock formation. Fracking has to do with how they hyd hydraulically fracture the well to be able to extract the natural gas into the system. Fracking has been, um, I think, a revolution uh, here in North America. It has revolutionized the amount of natural gas that we have in this, in this continent um, and has significantly contributed to energy savings for, for all North Americans. Um, so it has to do with the technology that we're now able to extract a lot more natural gas from wells that we, we, you know, we weren't able to do you know, 30 years ago. Was there a device that goes down the well and then hydraulically pushes out to shatter the, 
A shale or a break a shale? At a high level, yes. It, it's high pressure that's used to uh, essentially frack the rock, which then allows uh, for natural gas to come back up the and, well. And, and what kind of circumference around the well does fracking go? I think they can go out a couple of kilometers from, uh, so one vertical well, they can go out a couple of kilometers. So it's just a- oh, You're asking me, sorry, I didn't understand your question. Sorry? Sorry, I'm not sure if I understood your question. But I think you did. I, okay. you know, what big a perimeter around a well do you break the shale in? And so they, they send like a cylinder out horizontally at the bottom of the well to break the shale to allow more gas to yeah. escape. Is that how it works? I think I'll pause there because you're getting into, a, I don't understand that technology well enough okay. to send you a That's fair. That's, you I, right to start, I said if you don't know it, just tell yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I'll pause there. Yeah. Okay, that's all my questions <laughs> at this time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor Nan. Thank you for being here this morning. I just had a quick question for you about the Enbridge's um, track record as it relates to spills in Ontario specifically in this region and then Canada wide, please. So on the natural gas side um, here uh, in Ontario, we've had, you know, typically the, the, the um, first of all, natural gas, we don't use the word spill. Um, oh. And uh, the, leaks, leaks, would it be leaks? The vast, the Typically, it's a rupture. So rupture. the vast majority of our incidents are, are third-party line hits. So when you think about underground infrastructure, when people are building uh, or digging for any reason in any municipality, whether it's for road works, sewer works, water works, putting in a fence post, um, our, our, our systems do get struck. So this is the call before you dig. Sorry. Sorry, the question was how many? Uh, I don't have that information. I can tell you for Legacy Union Gas, it was a, just under 1,000 a year. Typically, this is residential service lines or the or mains out in the road, uh, typically quite small. Okay. And um, could you speak to the spill, uh, the impact of the spills on the environment? Uh, well, typically what happens with a, with a leak such as that, um, our crews are responding immediately. So we'll get a call from a homeowner or from a Terra One call or 911. We'll respond uh, as quickly as we can physically get there and stop the flow of gas. Um, once that has happened, we've made safe, we'll then seek repairs and then uh, reactivate the system. And uh, I appreciate hearing about your response when it, an incident occurs, but through the chair, my question was, could you please describe the impact on the environment? Well, in this case, natural gas dissipates into the atmosphere. So while there's a natural gas leak, that, that uh, will leak into the atmosphere and dissipate. And any conversation or comments about impact to waterways when your, your lines have ruptured um, near natural waterways? So again, natural gas is lighter than air. Um, so if there is a rupture in the pipeline, it will dissipate through, up through water, up through soil, uh, up into the atmosphere. And uh, through the chair, you had mentioned that you consulted with the local Indigenous community. What was the nature of the consultation and what impact or input did you hear from the Indigenous community? We did. We had a requirement to um, consult with three different Indigenous, indigenous communities. Uh, all three were consulted, had a discussion. Um, there were no outstanding concerns. Uh, there were questions around timelines, opportunities to participate, uh, things of that nature, I would say fairly routine. Um, at this point, there's no outstanding concerns that have been raised. Thank you, that's my questions. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, uh, thank you for being here. Um, I think there has been some concerns raised about the increasing width um, involved uh, with the corridor and the loss, and the loss of natural, um, <clears throat> the loss of the natural uh, area in and around. Would you care to comment about that? You, no. Mr. Chair. Let me just, I'll, I'll just put this up and see if it's helpful at all, but what I've tried to do here is illustrate um, pictures of what our, our easement would look like during construction and then obviously once we've remediated post-construction. Post um, again, it's really important, and this is part of the environmental report and part of environmental assessment, um, that we obviously bring these lands back to um, original condition as best um, as we can. And, uh, and you can see from these pictures that, you know what, uh, if you didn't know there was a pipeline there, um, you wouldn't know there was a pipeline there. So um, I think we need to be, make sure that we have appropriate lands to construct safely um, in these areas, and that is part of our environmental uh, review when we can we build our construction plan. Um, I appreciate um, 
your statement that you're not an expert in, in fracking and you're not here to speak to the process of fracking, uh, but you did um, endeavor to answer in part the question from one of my colleagues and I was wondering if you would also like to comment on um, some of the, um, the risks that have been identified with fracking. I'm not sure I can say a whole lot more in terms of, of fracking of itself. I think what's really important about your considerations for this project is this project again will tie uh, gas supplies back to our Don storage facilities, which then bring gas in from many sources around North America. Ultimately, it's the customer that will decide where they're going to purchase their gas, at what price, and from what supply source. Enbridge is a distribution company. We are not involved in gas exploration or fracking or production, so I really can't say a lot more about fracking in terms of, I'm just not an expert in that area, I'm sorry. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I appreciate you being here today and giving us some, some vital information that's important for us to understand. I'm trying to really get a, a handle on the OEB. You may not be able to help me or not. <laughs> Unique organization, I'll try. I know. Um, so you've conducted an environmental review, you've submitted the documentation, they make the decision on leave to proceed with the construction, and then you complete a whole bunch of studies after that. There's additional work, detail work that is required. Um, and obviously uh, we need to work with all of the local permitting agencies to gain all the necessary permits. So typically when the board will give their approval, it will be subject to acquiring all of the necessary permits uh, that required to construct. So. I'm struck by, and I sit on um, two conservation authorities and, and I'm on the NEC now, so I'm struck by that the ecological studies will happen afterwards, They're looking at invasive species and all of that along the route because you're doing your design. The board has already approved it, then you'll do all of that work to mitigate any impacts. Doesn't that seem backwards to you? If it's helpful, I do have a colleague here uh, with me today, I could ask him to come and speak. Uh, he's a little more knowledgeable about some of these than I am, if that works with you. Ryan, would this be... Yeah, I'm fine with that. Mr. Ryan Park is uh, an environmental advisor with, with Enbridge. He may be able to help provide a little more clarity. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, I, I'm, I'm not, struggling with... I can't answer questions I don't know, so yeah. I'll, I'll ask Ryan to try and help. Just for like the that. record, if you could introduce yourself. <coughs> uh, yes, I'm uh, Ryan Park. I'm the uh, senior advisor uh, for the environmental plan. Thank you. With Enbridge. So I'm used to environmental assessments on landfills, incinerators, and all of these large undertakings. And we have a, a very protracted environmental review, ecological studies, all of the potential impacts way out in front. It all goes to the Ministry of Environment, and then they make a determination from there. What I'm hearing from the OEB, it's a slightly different process yes. with energy I'm using the term track, but pipelines are... Corridors, yeah. Corridors, thank you, thank you. Um, so you, you do the work on the environmental review, which is narrowly focused to specific areas that the OEB has interest in up front. Then they make a determination as to whether or not you can proceed, and then you, they say to you, now you've got to complete all of these studies. Am I here? Do I understand that right? Uh, essentially, yes. So uh, we follow the environmental guidelines uh, for construction and operation of hydrocarbon pipelines, which define how the route selection proceeds. Mm -hmm. So when we come up, well, when the um, alternative routes are described and reviewed, they're reviewed on a higher level based on uh, information that's easily obtained. So they're uh, reviewed on the same level. After, it was, if the project received approval, then we would go through and through the permitting process and do the additional studies required to obtain those permits. And any additional mitigation that has not been previously identified in the environmental report as conditions of uh, permits would be applied. And so therein lies the challenge for me because all of those other studies are outside of the hearing process at OEB. They've already made the decision to say yes to the pipeline. Yes, but they've put a condition on that we have to receive all permits in order to construct the pipeline. Yeah, I understand. It's backwards in my mind anyways. So can I ask one more question if I can, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Um, the OEB has indicated and requested of all interveners their comments 
on expanding the scope for the study and they've asked for comments with regards to the methods of upstream natural gas extraction, such as hydraulic fracturing, which is Council Ferguson's commentary for the gas transported through the pipeline, as well as the impacts to the ultimate downstream consumption of the natural gas transported through the pipeline. So those two comments, and I think it only fair to actually hear from Enbridge in terms of your comment on the OEB's request to include those in the scope. What's Enbridge's position on broadening the scope beyond what it was initially? So uh, I certainly don't object to the discussion, and I think the board is receiving submissions on this topic. Um, and I think we, we too, as Enbridge, will be putting in our submissions on that. Uh, these are topics that typically are not part of a leave to construct uh, application, and so this is, this is a unique, I think a unique situation. I, I'm not sure what the board will do with that. Um, I think these are uh, topics of great interest uh, to Ontarians, and so I think we'll leave it to the Ontario Energy Board to decide whether they'll expand the scope uh, or not. Uh, either way, they will. You know, parties are able to put in their submissions for the board's consideration. And so you're not going to give us a hint in terms of what your position is at Enbridge? Uh, not today. You'll see our submission in front of the board. <laughs> There's a legal expression. Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm just going to put myself on the speaker's list. Councillor Clark, if you could take the chair for a moment. You have the floor. Thank you. So I, I'm trying to get a sense of the scale of this uh, project. So a 48-inch compressed gas pipeline seems like a significantly large pipeline. Um, could you comment on the scale of a 48-inch natural gas compressed gas pipeline compared to um, what's there now in you know, a typical installation? So our, our Don Parkway system is typically made up, it's made up of a number of different pipeline sizes. 48 inch is a fairly standard uh, pipeline size, particularly when we're going through areas where we don't want to construct pipelines, you know, we don't want to put in a 20 inch pipeline and then three years later come back and do it again. Um, so 48 inch is a fairly standard uh, size pipeline uh, for transmission pipe uh, here in Canada. So that's pretty routine. Uh, for the type of work that we do. We do construct different sizes in, throughout the province depending on the demand. So that would be a, a high pressure pipeline, correct? The product that's flowing through there is flowing through at a high pressure. Yep. And approximately what volume of gas would pass through that, um, say per hour or whatever um, unit of measure you want to use? One second here, I'm just looking up my notes on the capacity. So it, the pipeline size is 185, uh, what we call terajoules uh, in capacity. And again, 90% uh, of that will remain in the Golden Horseshoe, Go uh, Niagara and Toronto area. So capacity that a, ter a joule would be unit of energy, but unit of gas, do you, do you have that available? Cubic meters? Uh, I don't have that in cubic meters uh, with me, I'm sorry. So my, my next question would be um, the value of that gas that's flowing through the pipeline. So if uh, I think it was 195 terajoules of gas, is that in a unit of measure per day or how does that break out? Yeah, yeah, that's per day and uh, I mean the value of that would be um, you know, this, we're talking about millions of dollars worth of gas commodity flowing through this pipeline. So millions of dollars of gas commodity flowing through the pipeline each and every day, 365 days a year for the lifespan of the pipeline. Well, the, the, the capacity of the pipeline varies seasonally based on weather demand. So obviously it's higher in the winter and the cold uh, climate and, and uh, less so in the summertime. And again, I will just say 70% of this uh, gas is already being consumed in the province. So this isn't all incremental. We're simply uh, providing a cheaper pathway for this gas to get back to our Dawn storage hub as opposed to coming in through more expensive uh, mechanisms. What I'm getting towards is, as a municipality, um, in your presentation you had $686 of additional property taxes if this pipeline were to go ahead. Um, so there's an there's a intrinsic value to the municipality there in terms of tax revenue. But if we're talking about a pipeline that has millions of dollars worth of product passing through it every day, there seems to be a disparity to 
the benefit that the city is gaining from this from a tax perspective to the value to Enbridge. There's, there's an extreme disproportionate um, value relationship there. Well, let's, let's um, the value to this pipeline is for the customer. And then they, the, the value is getting cheaper supplies, more reliable supplies of natural gas to the end, end use consumer. And so our pipeline is regulated by the Ontario Energy Board. Our rates are set by the Ontario Energy Board. And so uh, the, the benefit here is really for the consumer. But at the same time, we as a municipality are being asked to either intervene or not or to you know, comment on this based on our residents, the benefit to City Hamilton. And those consumers are um, yes, throughout Ontario. It just seems like there's, there's a quite big disparity. So the, the benefit to Enbridge is enormous. The benefit to the City Hamilton seems relatively minuscule in the grand scheme. Well, again, the benefits are for the consumer. And so I would, I would suggest to you that when I think about the manufacturing base in the City of Hamilton, they rely heavily on natural gas to remain competitive on a global scale. And so I think keeping gas rates low uh, for those consumers is vitally important to the City of Hamilton. If I can help me to understand the root of this pipeline. So the gas, as you mentioned, starts at the, the Sarnia facility. It comes from all over, including uh, hydraulic fracturing gas fields in Pennsylvania, which would then go um, west through Ohio, Michigan to Sarnia. The gas that comes from the other areas, how does it get to Sarnia? So there are pipelines interconnected throughout North America. So. TransCanada, for, or TC Energy rather, has pipelines through the US. Uh, we have interconnects through numerous pipelines that come in through the uh, sort of Detroit River into the Sarnia and into that storage facility. Again, the North American uh, natural gas uh, pipeline grid, if you will, is highly interconnected. So we can source gas uh, virtually anywhere in North America and land it in Ontario, which is, again, the strategic value of that asset. And where does the other end of the pipeline go to? Where's the terminus? Um, well, we ultimately uh, tie back into TC Energy's pipeline on the east side of Toronto, and their interconnects then again on the east side of Toronto back in further east and further in the United States. Our assets uh, essentially end, um, give me one second. Yeah. So it's Milton, is probably to be really accurate. Our system kind of ends at Milton, um, and then we go into uh, the transmission system, and then it goes into other assets from there. So the, your system being Enbridge then ties into another system which is in, interconnected further east. And as you mentioned, all, all these pipelines, it's kind of like a, a spider web of pipelines as it sounds. That's right. Um, so you, you mentioned that 90% of the product flowing through this pipeline would be to Ontario uh, consumers and that 70% of that is, is current demand. I'm curious as to your projections that you used to justify the need for a new pipeline considering the direction that, um, well, globally, we're going to a, a net zero carbon economy in the next, the goal is 2050. Yeah, so I guess I'll say a couple things here. Um, when we look at global energy demand, uh, we are seeing population growth around the globe. We're seeing, we're projecting a 25% increase in global energy demands over the next two decades. Uh, and, and we need energy from all sources. So this is oil and gas, renewables. In fact, we expect renewables will probably be the, the most significant increase from today's production levels to that future state. Um, but the reality is the world needs energy and then it needs to be affordable and reliable. So I think that's, um, that's what we're seeing. That's why we're investing in renewable energy. We're looking at renewable natural gas, hydrogen, as well as conventional supplies. So you mentioned population growth as one of the drivers why this, this pipeline in particular is needed. And I think the assumption there is that through population growth, your gas heating, gas appliances, that kind of thing are driving demand. Is part of that calculation a shift from gas to building forms such as net zero passive house that have massive energy 
efficiency improvements over what's now that can be as I think I saw an article with uh, former Councillor Dave Braden's house that he said he's, you can heat it with a hair dryer. Is that part of the uh, the the calculation? I think when we look at long term, um, this is the integrated sorry integrated resource planning component of our application, where we look at how we can help customers save energy and become more energy efficient. And so we look at that, and that's a declining trend. If you were to look at the average use per household in Ontario over the last 25 years, it's been kind of like a snow hill. Um, it's been in steady decline as building envelopes have improved, winding constru uh, window construction, low flow thermostat, um, uh, type technology, roofing products, and so on. So we're seeing ever increasing energy efficiency. And I think that's, that's a huge component of Ambridge's business. We know that for every dollar we invest in energy efficiency, we get a $3 return. So that will continue to be a big component, um, but energy efficiency in of itself is not enough to overcome the increasing demand. And so these incremental capacity additions to our system is, is necessary. <clears throat> the pipeline that's being constructed, what's the, um, the life cycle estimate for this? So it's gonna be built in 2021. When would you expect that to be out of commission? Pipelines theoretically can last forever if they're maintained. Um, so age in and of itself is not a determination. Um, there's a whole bunch of considerations that go into when we ultimately decommission a pipeline. Um, so it's really difficult to nail that down to a particular date. I, I will say just, you know, I, I, where I think you're going with a number of these questions, I think your staff have proposed that you're gonna ask a number of these questions or potentially pose some of these questions in front of the board. I think uh, we're getting to a point where some of these questions might be better answered in that forum. Um, because we're starting to get into some of the technical details, I think. Well, it's a uh, your spokesperson for Enbridge, and uh, the chair, please um, correct me if I'm out of line. But you're not out of line. You have uh, the floor. You know, you're you're constructing a pipeline in 2021 that has a life cycle that, because technically forever, as you just said, goes far beyond the 2050 international targets to get to a zero carbon economy. So the, the direction of my question is, why would we build a pipeline now that we know our goal as a society is to be out of commission in 30 years? I think one of the compelling things that, that we're seeing around the world is the significant investments that are happening in renewable natural gas as well as hydrogen. So the natural gas grid today, even if you think here in the city of Hamilton, we're taking renewable biogas from your Woodward, Woodward uh, wastewater treatment facility, cleaning that up, injecting the system, and using it in your bus fleet. So we think the natural gas grid can continue to have a useful purpose uh, into the future, um, even in a net uh, carbon neutral world. So we're not precluding the opportunity to produce biogas, renewable natural gas, and use our network system uh, to support that. Councillor? Final question, um, Councillor Clark raised this as well. The two issues bet before the board are that they're asking us to consider is, is, is it appropriate to question or discuss the source of the gas and is it appropriate the, the downstream use of the gas? And I think I heard you earlier that you wouldn't object to those being discussed, but you would respond to that at, at the board. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. I will take the chair back. Um, I believe everybody on the list is second time, so Councillor Ferguson. Hey, thank you, and my first question is to, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, sir, the environmental expert. Um, yes, it's uh, Ryan. Perfect. Ryan, Ryan um, I think that the study that's of most interest to the citizens of Hamilton is about the uh, natural environment and natural heritage. And typically we hear about these ecological studies. Yes. Do you agree that will not get done un uh, until after the Energy Board um, approves your application? Well, we've produced an environmental report which uh, gives uh, details on the general environment as well as um, recommends mitigation uh, to prevent uh, significant impacts to those. Um, so there has been some significant work done on that matters. The site-specific uh, surveys to detail uh, individual plant species and uh, fish and other things along those lines uh, will be conducted uh, this spring and summer and fall and will be any additional details that come out of that for permitting reasons and additional mitigation will be determined after those studies are completed. Yes. You bring it back to a layman's terms then. So the macro work is done and the appendices or the detail work still needs to be done. Is that, that is correct. 
Okay. Is that called, a, 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 you called it something different than an ecological study. Are they one and the same? Uh, yeah, it, there's broad terms you can use for those, but yes. Okay. So I got a couple new questions. But first, before I do that, I want to recognize Scott Peck is in the room today. And Scott Peck is the, he's the person that processes the applications for the Hamilton Conservation Authority. And they do routine ones uh, within staff, but uh, Scott's the one that brings the detailed and complicated ones to the board for approval. So thank you for coming out today. Anybody has a question for Scott, feel free to do it. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna put you on the spot, Scott. You received the presentation. <laughs> and uh, so, th so thanks for coming out. Um, one other, one, couple more questions. Number one is, is this pipeline in that location going to be excavated into rock? Uh, we haven't completed the entire geotechnical investigation for it, but uh, there is likely rock will be encountered through some portions of the, the trench line, yes. Okay, because the rock is very shallow in the Flamborough area. Some locations, yes. Okay, so the whole thing's not in rock then. Is that it? I take that from your answer, is that to be correct? Uh, to my knowledge, the entire length of it wouldn't, is not entirely within rock, but uh, as to what proportion is, I'm not educated to say right now. Okay. Okay, and, and so when you excavate rock, do you use, is it blasting that you use with pipelines in close proximity? Oh, well, that's more of a uh, construction question, specific construction question. Um. Yeah, well, I guess what, I'll jump in here for a little bit. We do have another expert here, if, if you're so inclined, uh, can speak maybe a little more articulately about construction practices, but there are a number of uh, practices that are used for removal of rock um, until we get into the specific site details. It's hard to comment on whether, we, you know, how much of that would be, um, you know, blasting or any other form of construction technique. Okay, I, I'm just thinking about public safety and, and the, the workers' safety. Yeah. And, and so uh, with an existing pipeline within a few meters of the proposed trench, uh, and there'd be lots of seismic work that would have to be done to make sure you don't damage that pipeline. So uh, full ramming is another way to do it. Yeah. And, and so what exercise do you typically use in a new pipeline? You have to bring your construction person down, by all means do that. But when you're that proximity to existing pipeline, would you use a whole ram or would you use blasting? Or is there something different we just sought out? Bring them down. If you want to talk this level of detail, I'm gonna bring down another colleague here. I'll have George introduce himself in a moment. You're asking a lot of really good questions, but I can't answer all of them. <laughs> I appreciate that you came prepared with a team that was able to answer these questions. So it is, yeah. Please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, um, Deputy Mayor and Council and staff. My name is George Adams and uh, I'm the construction manager for Canada East, Granbridge. Okay, so you heard my question, I assume. We're up there with the, yeah. if the if pipeline is partially in rock, is what I heard. I'm not sure whether you got boreholes done yet to determine elevations of rock, but. Assuming you got to go through rock based on the answer I previously got, what type of rock demolition technology would you use? Yeah, so we'd use uh, one of two uh, methods or both methods. We'd either use blasting and or hole ramming. And uh, so we'd get our geotechnical uh, boreholes completed by our geotechnical consultant, and that would determine the volume of rock that we'd have to excavate depending on the, uh, the volume of the trench or the size of the trench that we would need. And uh, we would then work with our construction contractor and... Uh, you know, uh, try to identify, does it make more sense in this specific area to blast it or to hole ram it? And uh, in our 2015 Brantford Kirkwall project, which we did just west of here, we used both methods. And um, so we'd uh, hire a blasting consultant and a, and a blasting contractor. They would come in, they determine the, um, the distance from the existing pipelines and then set the charges so that the uh, seismic activity wouldn't be such that it would damage or harm the adjacent pipelines. Uh, we would have a uh, on-site blasting monitor to, uh, to monitor those, those charges to make sure that they were within the tolerances uh, agreed to beforehand. And then um, the rock would be blasted and then excavated with, uh, with a, um, an excavator with a, with a bucket, a rock bucket. And then a hole ram would be brought in to uh, clean out to make sure we'd end up with a nice, neat ditch. Uh, that rock, shot rock, would be uh, piled off to the side and then we would... Uh, work with landowners and, uh, and work with, uh, with the city and uh, with other municipalities to determine where the rocks should, uh, should go after, after the fact. So one you, of two you methods you are controlled, used. You controlled, I guess, the, uh, the seismic activity by delayed detonators to make sure that they, they don't all go off at once, I was suspect. Correct, yes. However, um, 
I don't know how much overburdens over the, uh, this rock. How do you protect the public from fly rock? Is it enough overburden to hold it in, or do you have to mat it? Well, there's blasting mats that are used. Yeah, so the you blasting. will engage blasting mats here to absorb that fly rock from becoming airborne. That's right, exactly. Yes, the uh, blasting contractor would bring in blasting mats. Those are placed over top of the uh, charges, over top of where the uh, trench is, is planned out for. And then um, you know, all of the, uh, the workers, the laborers uh, need to uh, leave that area. Uh, a horn is sounded and then the, uh, the, the charges are, are, are exploded and, and uh, the rock is uh, shattered. Uh, the blasting mats do you know, jump up a little bit, but uh, that prevents any rock from flying from the, uh, from the actual area. I was just trying to make sure that pu the public was comfortable with that they'll be protected from fly rock. Do That's you still right. use cut-up tires cabled together for, for blats? That's exactly the blasting mats that are used, yes. That's what was used in 2015. Okay, and my last question, sir, is uh, the um, is a big demand increase for natural gas due to uh, hydro generation because the coal plants are, are taken out of commission. Is that creating part of this big new demand for natural gas? Uh, I think that's part of it. Uh, I would say more so that 10% that's going into the U.S. So we're seeing significant uh, conversion from coal-fired power to gas-fired power in the United States. So that's driving part of that part of that demand. Here in Ontario, not so much. Um, you know, there's obviously a large amount of natural gas that uh, supports our electricity generation in Ontario today, um, but we're not seeing a significant increase there. Okay, that's all my questions, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, uh, thank you. As you can probably tell from the questions, it's um, we're sort of both confused, at least I'll speak for myself, uh, confused and uh, deeply worried about uh, this process, which is, is certainly not yours, uh, but now which we are potentially party to on behalf of our residents, including the very question that has been asked of staff, um, particularly as my colleague was saying, as it relates to our natural heritage and our, our water sources. How can decisions be made on the impacts of this project and the preferred route that you're looking for without any field data? Any, data, any detailed field data. So the ecological impacts, the fish habitat assessment, the species at risk, um, they're not available. Um, and they're not available to members of the, the public who genuinely want to um, be informed and be involved. And that is a concern of mine. Um, in response to a series of questions that was asked by our Deputy Mayor, on the, um, the millions of dollars uh, that uh, Enbridge will in, you know, enjoy from this project, uh, you referenced uh, that this is a cheaper pathway, those are your words, and that the value of this pipeline is to the cust customer. And I guess what I'm trying to understand in the absence of that detailed field data, if the value is with the customer, where does, who is the owner of the risk? Who owns the risk? Who's Which risk are you referring to? The construction risk or the operating the pipeline? So understand what? Uh, the, the pipeline itself and its construction and the risks that it could pose. For example, it's crossing areas of highly vulnerable aquifers. Um, we have response from our emergency service. Who, who bears the risk of a pipeline like this, both its construction and its operation? So in terms of construction and operation, Enbridge owns the pipeline, and so we bear that risk in terms of construction risk. Um, any cost implications of, do, of building that pipeline and operating that pipeline? I'm not sure if that was your question, Councillor. So as, an, as our existing assets today, we operate the natural gas grid here in Hamilton. Um, we, owe, we bear the risk of you know, maintaining and operating that pipeline. I guess what I'm trying to get at is the, the impact to the environment. Who bears that risk? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think you know, we're talking getting into the area of global warming and climate change. I think that's an issue for all of us. And who bears that risk? I think we all do. Thank you. Councillor Nan. Thank you, through the chair. Just a um, couple more clarifying questions, if I may, since, since the whole team is here. Um, 
can you verify uh, what makes up the gas that will be moving through this transmission? What kind of gas? Methane? It's, it's methane. Okay. Um, and um, through the chair, it's my understanding that methane, so in the last comment about climate action and climate change, um, that we all bear uh, the burden of ensuring that this planet is full of resources and uh, is a place that is thriving for future generations. Um, it's my understanding that greenhouse gases play a contributing factor to the potential of our future and that methane is a potent greenhouse gas prior to combustion. Is that your understanding? I think that's the consensus. Okay. Um, are you aware that there are reports that state that methane leaks are equated to being having more of a climate impact than coal? No. Not aware of those studies, okay. Um, and along this line, are there any uh, natural gas storage wells of Enbridge? No. Um, along this line, are there any uh, wells that are used to extract? No. And uh, just curious if you feel like sharing how much the construction cost is going to be. Well, it's a $206 million uh, project. And I'd have to refer to our evidence we filed publicly. Um, I think about half of that is material cost and half is construction cost. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. I appreciate it through the chair. Thank you. I have no further speakers, so I need a motion to oh, Councillor Partridge. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, and uh, welcome, gentlemen. So I live in Carlisle, and um, We've had a significant amount of work done in that area over the last, uh, I believe, 15 years. And um, that pipeline uh, was owned by Union Gas. Is it all now owned by you folks? Yeah. So Union Gas and Enbridge uh, merged. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was One and the same. That was not too long ago, though. Uh, we did one in 2015 and one in 2016. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the pipeline in Carlisle, I think, was built... Um, well, more than 10 years ago, but not all that long ago. There was work done in, um, with the pipeline that went through Courtcliffe Park. Are you uh, people, folks aware of that? Okay. And so where I'm coming from, I, I, you know, I live in the area. Your pipeline is right in my backyard, literally not that far away. And so we lived through all the construction, and uh, we've seen the results of that. So, yes, we all have lots of concerns. And I will say that the, uh, the neighborhood and the people up in Flamborough, by and large, who live along that route, have been able to witness what actually happens. And, and I just don't want the folks, like, I'm getting the sense that, you know, after the pipeline goes through, that it's, it's you know, shock and awe destruction, and, and what is left is, is, is horrible. And, and it's not. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the work at Courtcliffe Park, since you have said that you're aware of it, because it was quite extensive, and it is a wetland. I mean, much of the area in Flamborough is wetland. Yes. Okay, um, yeah, so we, we went, went through uh, Courtcliffe Park uh, twice in the last 15 years. Uh, we constructed the first 48 inch in 2006, and we constructed the second 48 inch in 2016. Both, of, both pipelines went through Courtcliffe Park. And the name of the um, creek that goes through Courtcliffe Park is Bronte. It's Bronte Creek, Bronte that's Bronte Creek, correct. that's right. Yeah, so Bronte Creek uh, is a fast flowing, um, uh, fairly deep creek. And uh, we crossed it during April, sorry, August, uh, September timeframe in both cases. And we used what's called a dam and pump um, crossing method, an open cut, open cut crossing method. So that involves the installation of uh, aqua dams. Uh, we would install the aqua dams uh, both upstream and downstream of the uh, pipeline crossing location. Uh, we would then uh, dam off that area and then pump it down. And then um, there was rock at our crossing location, so I believe we ho rammed that area. There was some soil, some overburden. We ho rammed that area. And uh, we um, then off to the side, we needed to um, get some temporary land use to weld up the section of pipe that would be used to cross the creek in that location. 
So in Corkcliffe Park, for example, we needed to uh, take the permanent easement for the pipeline, which is 28 meters wide. Uh, this question was asked earlier with regards to the area used. Uh, because we have three pipelines in parallel, we're able to overlap a new easement with an existing easement. So the additional area that we're taking for the permanent easement is an additional, I believe it's 16 meters, 15 meters uh, thereabouts. We also need temporary land use, uh, again, for construction activities. So those construction activities could include uh, setting up the uh, dam and pump operation, welding up the pipeline sections, parking of the construction vehicles, a uh, spot where we can uh, pile the spoil, the broken rock, the uh, stockpile, the topsoil, the subsoil, etc. And uh, so certainly within Corkcliffe Park, there was a lot of activity, and that activity would have started in mid to late May and would have carried on through to um, uh, late October. And... Um, and that's, that's our construction season. It starts in late May, typically after uh, the Victoria Day holiday, and then carries on through to um, uh, late October, the 1st of November, which is when we put the pipeline in service. Uh, once the pipeline is, in, is installed across the creek, we would then, um, Ryan's group here, uh, he would provide an environmental construction plan and environmental protection plan, and that lays out specifically, along with the permits that we receive, on how to restore that creek. So what type of rock to use, uh, how much um, uh, gravel to put down, the type of gravel, uh, how to restore the banks, what type of seed mixture is used um, within the banks, if we need to uh, plant any shrubs or trees in the area. And we not only um, follow in, uh, Ryan's environmental construction plan and the permit conditions, but we'd also speak to the uh, landowners and try to understand what their requirements are, not only throughout construction, but after construction. Do we need to install new fences during construction? Do we need a temporary access lane? Uh, do they have any special activities planned throughout the summer? Um, some folks had a wedding planned in their backyard. So we work, we have an um, on-site um, public relations person who would meet with the landowners and try to understand what their plans were throughout the summer, um, meet with the school boards, understand what the bus routes are. So a lot of planning goes into the construction season. During construction, again, I, I mentioned that construction season from May to late October. And then the year after, we come back, and typically in around the April time frame, once the snow melts, we'll do a physical walk of the entire pipeline route. We'll walk the 10 kilometers in this case. And on a landowner by landowner basis, we'll make notes. So, you know, we'll here we'll have to repair this fence, or maybe the seed didn't take, we'll have to re reseed this area. And we'll restore the area back to its original condition. We'll meet with the landowner, we'll meet with the permitting agency, with the, with the city, with the municipality, and to ensure that the lands, the road, the railway, et cetera, are restored back to its original condition. And um, that's, that's the process that's followed. And I really, um, Deputy Mayor, I really I appreciate the fulsomeness of your answer. Um, but I do want to expand a little bit because, or actually my next question, when you say creek crossing, um, can you just explain that? Because you don't literally lay the pipe across the creek. You go down underneath the creek. Correct. Yeah, so our minimum depth of cover beneath the engineered bottom or beneath the bottom of the creek to the top of pipe is 1.5 meters. And when we work with the municipality and the permitting agency, the conservation authority, et cetera, we'll uh, discuss the depth of the pipeline beneath the bottom of the creek. And there could be other utilities in the vicinity that we'll need to take into account, but uh, you're correct. that The pipeline is installed uh, a minimum of 5 feet or 1.5 meters beneath the bottom of that existing uh, creek. And on top of that, um, Deputy Mayor, I also want to point out that uh, timing, timing was actually fairly good because at the time that um, you did the work in Courtcliffe Park, Halton Conservation, who was the partner that, 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 um, that you folks worked with, uh, as well as the city of Hamilton and myself, I was there, um, the Bronte Creek needed to be uh, rerouted, if you will because of work that had been done many years ago by the private owner who had cut off the natural flow of the creek. And so it was a massive, massive project. And I will say that um, Union Gas, Enbridge, played a significant role in being able to assist with that, to, to actually physically move Bronte Creek back to the route that it was originally, put in new bridges, and, um, and also, I think one of the things, Deputy Mayor, that really uh, resonated with the community, the Friends of Courtcliffe Park had, over many, many years, constructed uh, birdhouses. 
and they were bluebird boxes. And they had been put up throughout Court Cliff Park. Uh, I would say a tune, probably about 110 of them. And Union Gas came in, removed all those boxes, and put them back up in another area, Mr. Deputy Mayor. In addition to that, when the, cre when the actual project was finished, and it did take a considerable amount of time, and I believe it was around $6 million, uh, with new bridges, um, the creek bed, the health of Cliff Park, it's been astounding how it has changed in the last five years. Uh, for the first time, Deputy Mayor, we had uh, bluebirds in our backyard three years ago, and they've been back every year. They're all over Cliff Park. The martins are back. Um, the flora and the fauna, it's incredible. I don't know how many trees you planted there, but there was a significant amount of trees. So that course for that pipeline went, as I say, right across Carlisle and right through our backyards. And the trench that was, that was built there, which you know, I think was around uh, 30 meters wide, has been uh, grown in terrific. You can see coyote, you can see fox, the deer are in that um, swale. It's like a, a giant swale. And it runs through the golf course as well. So I don't want folks to get the impression that when you go through and do your build, Deputy Mayor, it is not shock and awe and absolutely horrible. The flora, the fauna, the animals that have come back, the birds, it is astounding to us the folks that live in there, on the different songbirds that have come back to the area. I'm not saying it's all because of, of uh, Union Gas or Enbridge, but certainly the bluebirds have been, it's been absolutely fabulous to see them. So I do have questions, I do have concerns. I've been involved in um, the work that's been done, not only by, your, by Enbridge, but Union Gas over the years. And, um, you know, and the city has, has worked with you folks. Um, and there are still, as I say, some things that, that uh, you know, there are concerns about, but from my perspective, when I look at the environment, which is so important to me and to the people who live in the rural area, because that's, that's, that's what the rural area is all about. You have no better stewards of, of, of land than the farmers and those of us who live out in the rural area. So I just want to thank you very much for coming forward. Um, and I will continue to work with staff and, uh, and, and get our questions answered. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I do appreciate the... Um, thank, you. thank you. Are there any partridges? There are. Really? There are. I have one follow-up question. Did you want to address anything in that? Absolutely. Just thank you for your comments. I do have one follow-up question, so I'm going to hand the chair over to Councillor Clark, and then we will receive the pre presentation and then open the floor up to questions to staff. Go ahead, Councillor. My follow-up question, and Councillor uh, Partridge just mentioned the, and uh, you in one of your replies mentioned the landowners and discussions with landowners. So my question is, who are the, the landowners along this route? So when, um, yeah, I have a set of alignment drawings uh, uh, with me, but anyways, uh, um, one of the first steps is to identify, to work with our environmental um, group and our, our consultant to identify the, uh, the potential routes. Uh, once, uh, once a route um, has been considered, we'll then uh, identify or create a landowner line list. Uh, we'll identify the permanent easement required, the temporary uh, land use required, the permanent, uh, sorry, the temporary easement requirements, and we'll create a landowner line list. We'll, um, we'll check with the registry office and, and get an idea as to who the landowners are. Um, once we go through the, through the complete process, we will then um, have a series of pre-construction landowner interviews, and uh, we'll have a, a drawing on a per landowner basis. And that drawing will uh, identify exactly you know, how many acres of permanent easement are required, how many acres or hectares of temporary easement are required. And uh, we'll pr sit down with the landowner at their home and uh, and describe to them what construction activities will be occurring on their property, when those construction activities will occur. Um, you know, try to understand if they have a septic system or a sprinkler system, um, you know, what fencing they might have or livestock. Uh, in the case of a farmer, for example, where he has uh, systematic tiles in place for, uh, for land drainage, uh, if we have to hire a tiling consultant and a tiling contractor to put in a pre-construction tiling system, 
um, and then you might have a large culvert uh, in, on his property. So we make a landowner <coughs> line list, we have our pre-construction landowner interviews, and we record that and then share that with our construction team to ensure that during construction, all of those requirements are met. We also have on site during construction a land relations agent, and if the project is large enough, we may have two LRAs, two land relations agents, and our LRAs are out ahead of construction, meeting with landowners, and just, again, just following up, are, are there any concerns? Uh, you know, we're coming through today, um, you know, prepare, be prepared for this construction activity to occur. Um, we send out uh, newsletters to the community, uh, you know, advising them as to what's happening this month, for example, and we really try to um, communicate, you know, as, as much as we can daily, weekly with the local community to ensure that they understand what our plans are for that construction season. But we do have a registered list of landowners, and uh, once we um, have an agreement uh, that this easement has uh, been accepted by both parties, it'll be registered with the uh, registry office, and uh, we then need to stay within the confines of that easement. So we'll stake out the easement, um, and then our construction contractor uh, must stay within the confines of that temporary or, public, or uh, private easement. So Enbridge, as a company, as a corporation, does not own this property, you enter into a permanent easement with landowners along, along the corridor. So the landowners individually still own their property, but Enbridge has a permanent easement with rights and access to that corridor. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. So um, there'll be a, an easement uh, registered with the registry office. Uh, there'll be conditions within that easement. There's also uh, with uh, you know, previously with Union Gas and a landowner, there's a land, uh, letter of understanding. That letter of understanding is about a 28, 30 page document. Uh, and it basically lays out, um, you know, specific questions that have come up over the years, um, you know, where fences can be installed, uh, you know, vegetation. Certainly the, a farmer, for example, can continue farming over top of the easement and uh, can continue growing his crops. Um, and uh, certainly if anyone's planning on doing an excavation, certainly want them to follow the Ontario One Call protocol. And, um, but they're certainly able to continue enjoying the service rights that they've had previously. Uh, but there are some um, notes within the LO, the letter of understanding and the easement document with regards to permanent structures. So for example, there's a minimum distance from the pipeline to say um, you know, a garden shed or a barn that must be maintained. Um, and those would be the same for, for any utility, for any pipeline company. Are those property owners, uh, you negotiate individual easements with each property owner, are they compensated for those permanent easements? They are, yes, yes. So um, again, our lands department um, goes through a series of steps with getting fair market value for properties in that specific area. Um, you know, working with real estate agents um, and, um, and or the registry office again or the, or the, the municipality. And um, depending on the land use, whether it's agricultural, residential, commercial, they will establish a cost per acre or a cost per hectare for that specific permanent easement and temporary land use. And uh, if it's agricultural land, there's a payment made for the crop that would have been impacted, whether it's soybeans, corn, wheat, whatever the crop happens to be. Um, and then um, there's a payment schedule that's included in the LOU, the letter of understanding. Again, that's discussed with the landowner. There's a few options available to the landowner as to how the uh, payment is, um, is, uh, is made to the landowner. So in that, in that process, what happens if there's a landowner that refuses to enter into a permanent easement or a landowner that doesn't believe that the amount being offered is, is fair? Um, or if there's somebody that, for whatever reason, just doesn't want a pipeline in their backyard, uh, what happens in those circumstances? Well, there's the um, expropriation process in, in the province that's available, and uh, I'm not in the lands department. Uh, I can't um, quote specific statistics, but I don't recall us expropriating... We have, we haven't expropriated in many years. This is that's a rare that's a very rare situation where we're not able to come to an agreement with a landowner. Sometimes it takes time, but uh, again, we're 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 actively working with our individual landowners to come to an agreement. So Enbridge, as a as a private corporation, has the ability to expropriate other private property. How does that work? 
Uh, we're getting into an area here. I don't know if George, if you can speak to that, but getting out of my, I'm aware of our public ability to expropriate when there's a demonstrated need for public good, but I'm, I'm maybe that's a question I'll ask to our staff of, of how a private corporation can expropriate private property from somebody else. It's deemed in a public interest by the OEB and then it's through the Expropriation Act. Thank you, so those are all my questions. I will take the chair back. Councillor Clark, you have a question for staff. But, Correct. Uh, uh, Councillor Vanderbeek, uh, question for the presenters. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Most of my questions have been answered through either your presentation or questions that my colleagues have asked. But I do have a couple of specific questions. Um, the, the route that this project will take already has pipelines in it, correct? Correct. So can you tell me how many times that area has been disturbed to put pipelines in and roughly when um, in the past? Do you know when those pipelines went in? Well, the, the 26 inch was installed in, I think it was 1957, and it's, um, it's a bit north of where existing, where the proposed 48 inches. I, I can't tell you exactly how far north, but it's on, the map. it's on the map. Oh yes, you can see it on the map. So a couple of hundred meters north of where the proposed 48 inches. Uh, we then have a 34 inch pipeline that is in close proximity to where the new 48 inch is being proposed. And the 34 inch was installed late 60s, early 70s. I can't quote the exact year. Um, a 48-inch then was installed in close proximity to the 34-inch. Uh, the 48-inch the, the was installed in about 1989-1990, and uh, this will be the fourth pipeline, um, the second 48-inch. And another 48-inch. Correct. Second 48-inch. So the, there's a 26-inch, a 34-inch, uh, a single 48-inch today, and this will be a proposal. So this route has already been disturbed three times? Correct. Prior to this. Thank you. So. My next question is about, um, I, I, I will ask staff, but my understanding is that there was and may still be a blasting bylaw in Flamborough, which you would have been, uh, which would have, at least in the 89-90, um, I think would have been in place, which part of which required a pre-construction study of people's houses, but things that are close to where you'll be blasting. I, I guess my question to you is, is that a practice that I heard, I did hear what you said about the things that you're doing. I want to know specifically, is that the practice that you will use um, in this instance so that the people along that line that where the work is being done will be assured that if there's a new crack in their basement, they won't have to prove it because you will have done the study and they will have a copy of that. That's right, yes. So uh, during the pre-construction landowner interviews um, and, and earlier than that, um, so first of all, with regards to a structure, we will identify, you know, there's a house, there's a barn, there's a garage, there's an outbuilding, and we'll identify how close it will be to the proposed uh, uh, running line. Uh, we'll then, you know, through discussions with the landowner, if they would like, we can certainly do a pre-construction survey of that um, structure, and we can do a pre-construction and a post-construction survey. And, uh, you know, check the drywall, check the plaster, the foundation, and provide a report to the homeowner, to the uh, landowner, with regards to that specific structure. Um, additionally, uh, water wells are also um, identified, and uh, you know, septic system, for example. Um, if there are structures that the landowner has concerns with, uh, certainly bring them to the attention of our um, my construction group as well as our lands relations agent, and uh, we can document them on a drawing, and then um, hire the um, pre-construction consultant to come out and do the necessary study both before and after, both before, during, and after construction. Thank you, those are my extra questions. Thanks very much. No further questions on the presentation. So it was moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for staff, Councillor Clark. Thank you. So um, there's a copy of a motion that was provided to the staff and to the councillors from the Conservation Authority. If staff wishes to present, I'm fine with that too. 
There's, there is, we haven't got to item 7.1 yet, which is the staff report. So, Councillor Clark, you can add. No, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think where the confusion is, is there was a last minute um, our presentation added at the end where they decided that if committee would like, they will do the presentation. So I did provide hard copies, but it is up to committee whether or not so they wish to do see the, the presentation. presentation first then, and then I'll ask questions after that. I'm fine with that too. Okay, is, is there's other speakers on the list. Is everybody okay? We'll hear the staff presentation and then question for staff. Okay, perfect. We'll move on to item 7.1, staff presentation. Is that you, Guy? I'll start it off, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to read a, a short statement because there's been a lot of uh, confusion around process. There's been a lot of confusion around timelines, and uh, clearly this is an application uh, that is to the O. OEB, the Ontario Energy Board, not our process. Um, we've heard all the concerns uh, expressed before this meeting, during this meeting, and I thank the delegates for, for their comments. Um, and there may be opportunities to, to look at ways to in, increase that, uh, that input from the public uh, as I, I get into this. So I, I'd like to advise we amend the recommendations today um, because of all these these uh, short time frames. Um, the report before you has recommended uh, two things, but uh, we would like to defer the first recommendation in the report and um, and revise the second uh, recommendation B. Um, so the reason I, I think we need to, to uh, defer recommendation A, um, hopefully to a meeting uh, that is before the end of, of February. Um, the extraordinary clerk that you have indicated that we have a meeting on February 19th. It might be appropriate to give the public, if you so desire, uh, more opportunity to bring their issues forward. Um, it's also important uh, for us, because of the timelines of the procedural order that we received on January 30th to get our um, comments and uh, um, interrogatories in by Monday. So it's a very tight timeline, so it's important that those interrogatories, which are interspersed in the staff report, and, and Alvin will go through those uh, with you, uh, be summarized and included in a letter back to, uh, or a correspondence back to the Ontario Energy Board before Monday in accordance with the uh, procedural order. Um, it's also important that we identify and acknowledge the, the issues that they've asked us to, uh, to look at um, that's been mentioned already by Councillor Clark and others. Um, and also it's important for us to add any further interrogatories today um, that we may wish to, to include in that correspondence to the OEB for Monday. Um, that being said, uh, we'll leave that uh, for the committee uh, to decide. Uh, recommendation B, we wish to revise as well. Uh, to be a little more flexible in terms of our timing. There are components here that we can uh, delay for a short period. Uh, so that, and, and I don't know if uh, you have this before you, but I'm just gonna read it. Uh, the, the, it should be revised to state uh, that in response to the Ontario Energy Board's procedural order dated January 30th, uh, 2020, the general manager of planning and economic development be authorized and directed to file written submissions on behalf of the city that are consistent with the issues outlined in the report before you. Um, that'll give us the flexibility not only to include all the interrogatories that we need to respond to the OEB on, mo on Monday, uh, but also um, leave the door open to confirm our uh, intervener status, maintain that intervener status at least until February 19th if you choose to, to uh, receive the information.
information at that time and ask for more public input. And if you choose to withdraw as an intervener, uh, convert the comments and issues list that we've identified in our report and uh, from the public as well uh, in a letter of comment. Uh, again, uh, that's the convoluted short version of the process, but uh, that's what we're putting before you today uh, in recognition of all the input that we received in basically the last few days and before. Uh, we had a week to react to this, so it was, uh, we had planned to, uh, to bring the report forward in March, March 25th meeting. Uh, we obviously didn't have that luxury of time and we still don't, so time is of the essence. So I, I would not push a further meeting beyond February 19th and uh, there is a request uh, to have a decision by April 30th. Uh, so, if you back that up, we really <coughs> press for time and we need to uh, uh, condense our discussion and make sure that we get all our issues on the table to uh, the OAB as soon as possible, okay? Um, including the climate change issue, which uh, in particular, which uh, Alvin will outline uh, now more specifically as, as he uh, presents his part of the report. Please, into, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Alvin Chan, uh, Manager of Legislative Approvals and Staging Development in Growth Management. Um, so as you know, this is for the Enbridge Gas Incorporated leave to construct application for the 2021 Dawn to Parkway extension, as well as the integrated resource planning proposal. Um, this uh, presentation is a little out of date, as Guy had mentioned, uh, as we are uh, amending the recommendations before you today. So again, just to recap, it is a 48-inch diameter natural gas pipeline, 10.2 kilometers long, running from the Kirk valve, Kirkwall valve site to the Hamilton valve site. According to their application, the project will provide incremental capacity of 92,174 gigajoules per day on Enbridge's uh, system, with an expected in-service date of fall of 2021. In particular, the pipeline runs through boards 13 and 15 specifically, as shown in uh, the diagram here, which is the line in red. So again, as mentioned, we did receive the procedural order by email on January 30th by the OEB, uh, which I will provide to you in slide six. Um, as Guy had noted, uh, we are obligated to provide a response by February 10th, 2020, regarding the draft issues list attached as Appendix A to the procedural order, as well as confirming two additional items for the scope with respect to the leave to, constru leave to construct proceeding. I believe you guys have uh, already heard about the um, two scope issues uh, earlier today, so I'm going to skip towards the uh, draft issue. Again, the staff recommendation has changed since the formulation of this uh, presentation. With respect to the draft issues list, staff are in agreement with the 10 issues that have been identified. However, one concern that we feel, uh, listening to council, committee, as well as the public citizens, is with respect to climate change. So again, given the lifespan of the proposed pipeline being beyond 2050, and as it falls fully within the municipal boundaries of the city of Hamilton, the issue that we feel should be addressed by the OB is how does Enbridge's proposed leave to construct application address the city's Hamilton, city of Hamilton's declared climate emergency, as well as any of the subsequent policy and goals that we have passed since that time. So we would recommend that this be included as part of the submission to the OB under the revised recommendation, uh, identifying this particular additional issue to be added to Appendix A of the current procedural order as a draft issue for a review. In terms of review, uh, it's within, your, within the staff report uh, it was circulated to a variety of uh, staff on our pipeline technical review team. With respect to emergency response, Hamilton Fire uh, Department do not have any major concerns in terms of interrogatories, but have identified seven standard conditions of approval uh, required for this proposal. That includes financial responsibility, emergency action plans, contact information, and the like. With respect to cultural heritage resources, the lands were identified as meeting seven of the 10 criteria for archeological uh, value. A, the submission by Enbridge did include a stage one archeological assessment, which uh, recommended additional study 
um, which is one of the conditions requested by our cultural heritage planner. Uh, as well as two other conditions with respect to a built heritage. There is a uh, heritage property at 750 Concession 8 West uh, that is within about 50 meters of the proposed route. Uh, again, with respect to Councillor Ferguson's contentions with respect to blasting, that was a concern for staff as well, especially with a built heritage resource. Um, so that has been requested with respect to a vibration study. Um, and we will be, in light of today's uh, discussions, also reviewing the necessity under the city's bylaws mentioned earlier with respect to preconditioned blast surveys and post-construction uh, post um, uh, uh, investigations afterwards with respect to blasting. Um, that is currently not in your report, but after hearing that today, that's something staff will definitely go back and investigate. With respect to natural heritage, uh, Kathy Plaza is in, in attendance today if there are any detailed questions required. Uh, but however, based on the Stantec report that was submitted as part of the application by Enbridge, it has resulted in 13 interrogatories that have been requested. I think you've heard about it today that a lot of the field work and the field data with respect to species at risk, as well as significant habitats, were not, were not addressed and there are significant concern to staff, uh, especially as mentioned by Councillor uh, Clark, uh, the potential or feasibility of mitigating after the fact uh, because OEB would have granted the approval conditional upon these studies. So that is a concern raised by staff with respect to that. In addition, uh, significant woodlands were not addressed uh, within the route. That is something else that uh, has been requested by our natural heritage planning staff. And lastly, uh, with respect to the impacts, there are some questions of how the impacts are assessed, again, with respect to the field data not being available at the current time. So that has led to 13 interrogatories that we would like to request Enbridge to respond to through the OEB. In addition, again, should the OEB approve the application uh, out of, uh, uh, <coughs> we have uh, included eight conditions of approval should that occur. Uh, with respect to source water protection, they also revealed the Stantec report. Again, as noted by Councillor Wilson, it does go through some headwaters and some areas of concern. That being said, source water protection, uh, we're asked to attend today, but I don't think they're here. Uh, however, they have asked for five conditions to address those matters. Again, those are contained in, within the staff report, and they feel that those conditions will address their concerns. Um, I repeat cultural heritage there, my apologies. The next one was climate change uh, from our Healthy and Safe Communities group. In review of the proposals, two interrogatories were raised, and again, uh, should it be approved, there is one condition that is also attached uh, should the OEP decide to approve the, the, the proposal. Lastly, is with respect to corridor management, uh, the proposal does cross three uh, municipal roadways as identified in the staff report. With respect to those crossings, they would be addressed by the current 2000 model franchise agreement between the city and Union Gas, which is now Enbridge. Uh, which is dated March 28, 2007, and as authorized under the bylaw passed by this council under 07090. Uh, so they feel that their concerns will be addressed by the master agreement and no further actions required on their end. Um, that concludes, in essence, the review by the technical review team. And as mentioned by Guy this, this earlier, uh, we propose to you to amend the revision, or sorry, amend the recommendation, deferring uh, recommendation A and amending uh, recommendation B as provided. Thank you. Councillor Clark, you still have the floor. Thank you very much. And um, first, we should thank Mr. Paparella and all the staff for the report because it is comprehensive. And for some quick modifications based on some changes that came down from the OEB that I don't think anyone around the table was expecting as of last Friday, um, which I think was a bit of a surprise, not just to us, but to the industry in general. Uh, I do want to mention, because uh, I think it's important to get it on the record, that the Hamilton Conservation Authority, they're in a slightly different situation than the City of Hamilton because they actually have property that would require easements. And so they have opposed the easement request pending the results of an ecological study, an independent peer review, and the pending decision based on those studies from the OEB. Um, and that goes to one of the first uh, issues that that I've raised a couple of times is, is the ecological study, the way it, it, it currently works at the OEB, and I know staff are wrestling with this as well as myself, is that they've completed an environmental review. All of these other studies haven't happened yet, so there's going to be a decision by the OEB to move forward 
So they've got the right to proceed with, with uh, the, the construction, and then they have to do all of these studies. It doesn't work the opposite way, and, and what we requested at the Conservation Authority was that the ecological study and independent peer review happen first, and then the OEB would make their decision, and I'm suggesting that we would be making the same request here at the municipality. We have the same concerns about the her natural heritage of that, of that property, um, and I'd like comments from staff on that idea to suggest to the OEB that the ecological study be completed first with the independent peer review prior to them making the decision. Right. Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, you're, you're quite correct. That's the usual course of action that we take as a municipality when we're doing either uh, environmental assessments, uh, planning projects, any planning or development approvals. Um, all that information is provided up front by independent view um, of those those studies. Um, this is an unusual process for us, uh, but, um, one that the OEB uses a, as a matter of course. So um, in, in all cases, approvals are conditional on, on various studies, and in, in this case, uh, uh, I think staff would agree that based on our review of our subject matter experts, uh, Ms. Plaus, uh, indicates the same concerns, and uh, we would probably uh, concur with your conclusion that it should be done in advance. So, to, to be clear, staff would be supportive of that request. Uh, we, we need to put it on the record, though. We have no authority. We're making a request that this be done in the interest of the environment, in the interest of full transparency, in advance of a decision, so that we can make informed decisions, we're a commenting body. We don't even have property on the line where an easement is at issue, correct? That's correct, except for those three road crossings. That's exactly. Correct. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with that, and that would fit into all of the interrogatories that were listed earlier in the report that we have in, in the document. The question of intervener status. I, I understand um, the recommendation is to maintain intervener status until February 19th. Um, one of the issues that has come to my attention from some environmental lawyers is that we've secured intervener status. If we withdraw from intervener status, then we can't submit interrogatories after that point. And so would it not be prudent to maintain intervener status, whether or not we exercise and, and, and do any actual work on it, we're monitoring what's being said, and if we need to provide an interrogatory, staff can come to council and we can proceed down that road. So can I get a comment on that, please? Uh, I'll uh, take this one, Mr. Chair. Um, technically, we don't have intervener status. Oh. We've applied for intervener status, mm -hmm. but the commission or the board will not decide who it will award intervener status until it finalizes its list of issues. And you'll see that in their procedural order. So we have our foot in the door. There is no prejudice to us to maintaining our present position. Um, so we don't have to formally withdraw from the application for intervener status, which we presently enjoy. So maintain it until such time as something changes and we can make a determination at that time. Through the chair. So I anticipate the way this is going to unfold. What they've given you is a draft list of issues. Yes. We will now comment on that draft list of issues and ideally bring to their attention the issues that are in the report and what council committee produces today. They'll take that on board and then develop what they will call their final list of issues. That then will define the scope of the hearing going forward. Then we'll be better placed to ascertain should we pursue intervener status and if so, what are the costs and what are the resources we would need to do that? Thank you, and that's very helpful. One of the other things that we've been asked by a number of, of, of parties, and the Conservation Authority made the request of the OEB uh, last night, was to request an oral hearing as opposed to a written hearing where it's just an exchange of written documents back and forth. Um, I'm not even sure how often the Ontario Energy Board does oral hearings. I know that it's become a challenge getting that for environmental assessments in the province of Ontario. Can you care to comment on that 
and, and the, the um, upside or downside to requesting that they consider an oral hearing. So through the chair, um, you're correct. Their, their normal fashion of conducting a hearing is purely through written documentation. And they tend to be a highly specialized board. It's a technical board. It's not an expertise, for example, from a legal perspective we would have in-house readily. So if we were going to participate fully in the hearing, I'd anticipate we'd go out and retain somebody with particular expertise. We may or may not need some consultants slash experts, and that's where the costs can become uh, significant. You'll note in their commentary that um, they've alluded to the fact that the interest this particular application has attracted is unusual, particularly the environmental issues which they don't normally deal with. So that's an additional complication that obviously they are sorting through. Um, so it may be that based on that, they may decide to go uh, the oral hearing route. Oral hearings candidly tend to last longer and cost more than written hearings. Can I also ask the question, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is it possible that the OEB would decide to do a hybrid process where the technical arguments um, would be done in a written format, but on the environmental, climate change, things like that, that would be a, uh, an oral hearing component. Is that a, a possibility? Through the chair, that's definitely a possibility. Like any other board, they're going to try and seek efficiencies. So that evidence where there's little argument or there's some consensus, they could proceed by writing. Where there are facts in dispute, usually uh, that lends itself more readily to an oral hearing where you can cross-examine. Thank you. So if, if I can just read a quick paragraph, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I know I've taken up eight minutes, but um, some of that have been answers. Um, that staff be directed, this is from the HCA now, that staff be directed to advise the Ontario Energy Board that the Hamilton Conservation Authority encourages the Ontario Energy Board to take climate change considerations into account when determining if the natural gas pipeline is in the public interest as they consider the leave to construct. So is that consistent with what we're talking about in our interrogatory when we're raising that the city of Hamilton has, has indicated that we have a, a climate emergency and as such, we're asking for further um, discussion, concentration on that aspect of climate change. Through the chair. So uh, the reference to interrogatories is somewhat confusing. It is. Because interrogatories essentially are a formal discovery mechanism whereby you ask written questions. What's happened here is they've developed their draft list of issues based on a series of questions. From our perspective, to the degree that our issues are not adequately addressed in their draft list of questions, we should pose those issues by way of questions to them, but they don't necessarily meet the technical de definition of interrogatories. Um, with respect to the test they use, that essentially they're stating the public test. Is it in the public interest or not? to approve this leave to construct. So they're just citing their legal, uh, their legal test. Thank you. So when I'm looking at the, the two questions that the OEB asked for comments from those, so item one and item two, one deals with, um, I find these, uh, my, I, I find them a little bit nebulous. Um, impacts related to the methods of upstream natural gas extraction, such as hydraulic fracturing for natural gas that would be transported through the pipeline. So my interpretation is that is they're asking whether or not we think this should be included in the scope. And when I'm reading this, it, it seems to imply to me what is the impact to the environment from hydraulic fracturing upstream. Am I reading that correctly? Through the chair, I think your read is, uh, reflects the comments that they make on page two and three of their procedural order where they allude to those issues. So, so yes, that's a summation of the issues that they've identified arising out of the public comments that have been made on the application so far. And if I may, Mr. Deputy Mayor, on number two, it says Im impacts related to the ultimate downstream consumption of the natural gas transported through the pipeline. Again, I'm looking at it through the lens, it, it seems to be implying what's the impact to the natural environment, um, the climate, greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the utilization of that gas that's coming through the pipeline. And I reading that correctly? 
to the chair. I think that's a reasonable read. I, I might suggest that to the, the, the degree that they don't capture as precisely as you want the issues you want addressed, that you outline them more precisely and we could add them into the uh, list of questions we would ask them. And so then, um, Mr. Paparella, the questions that staff put forth in the interrogatories and, and on climate would reflect that we would, in essence, say to the OIB that we support the inclusion of these two items in the scope of the review, and then we would add further interrogatories specific to climate or environment that may um, reference back to those two items. Is that a fair statement? that we listed in the report, uh, the one that was on the screen that Alvin put up, especially uh, is, is important from our standpoint and um, our climate change uh, subject expert is here as well and, and he indicated that that was uh, an important list of, of three questions that would clarify that Thank you. concern. If there's others you wish to add as as uh, uh, Mr. Kine has indicated, uh, you can clarify, modify, amend, add to that list. Sorry, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we're asking here is an actual draft issues list. It's not an interrogatory. We're saying this is an issue uh, that we do want addressed. And then there were two additional interrogatories from the climate change group, which are included in, your, in the staff report that we could pose as well. But we felt this was an issue given and so when we were list, lifting the, list, oh, I can't even speak, listing the draft issues, and we provide them to the OEB and ask for them to consider these issues without putting it into an interrogatory in terms of, as per, the, per what the lawyer said, or do we have to specifically put it into an interrogatory or they're just going to dismiss it? I don't mean to be pedantic, but I've found that these tribunals can be most definitely pedantic. <laughs> Through the chair, I, uh, the format they've chosen is a question format to outline their issues. So presumably our issues are gonna have more resonance with them if we frame it in that fashion. At the end of the day though, if we don't frame it as a question, but we articulate the issue correctly, I don't think that would be prejudiced by that. Okay, thank you. So I, I heard you say it, it wouldn't it prejudice us I don't think it would prejudice a reasonable reader of that question, but I can't speak to how uh, they're going to do their analysis and develop their final list. Um, I think those are all of my questions. I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's a fascinating situation, and, and I, I think we need to state very clearly that we're not taking a position opposing or supporting. We're asking for further evaluation which is pertinent to our need as environmental leaders in this community to make sure that the work is done by the OEB before they make the decision. And I think that's an agreement from all staff and council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Just procedurally, Madam Clerk, um, do we need to receive this presentation? Just maybe give. Yes, to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we do. And then you can have a seat back on the, the bench there. So motion to receive presentation moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried, thank you. So continuing questions for staff, Councillor Ferguson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I gotta tell you, uh, I'm a little confused now. When we heard the community delegations, we heard the Embers delegation, there seems to be some pretty significant disconnects. Uh, the one being that the biggest one for me being is that 100% of this uh, gas was cutting through Canada to go back into the U.S. When, and I hear Enbridge say that 90% is, is going to be consumed by Ontario. And so that's a, a big change that I have to, you know, think about more. But Guy, you're suggesting that the Ontario Energy Board has given us an extension until mid-late February in order to respond. Is that what I heard you say? And Mr. Kine can correct me, but basically what we're dealing with is a procedural order for interrogatories and for that issues list that's in the procedural order for Monday, okay? Uh, there is still time to submit other issues uh, and uh, you know, deal with okay. our whole. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna drill down on uh, 
uh, and I've learned a lot just listening to the other questions, whether or not we maintain our request for intervener status by time hearing. Now we don't have to do that today. Correct. Okay. So, okay, so I heard you read the, the, the amendments out, but I don't see them on the screen or on a piece of paper so I can understand them better. Uh, will we have that before we vote? Madam Clerk, I know you've been trying to get a printout. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Unfortunately, I am unable to print here. Um, it is a paragraph, so I will um, read it out, and then in the meantime, I will try to type it out and email it downstairs. Can you to put the it up on the screen? Is that possible? Uh, probably not. This is not my laptop, so I don't have printing status. I don't have access to a lot of the things I normally would but I'll be happy to have it printed out before you consider it at council, um, which is right after this. But in the meantime, I think what, if I'm reading it correctly, the delete and replace is that in response to the Ontario Energy Board's procedural order one, dated January 30th, 2020, the general manager of planning and economic development be authorized and directed to file written submissions on behalf of the city that are consistent with the issues outlined in report PED 20053. Okay, and so is there, based on the conversations that Councilor Clark just raised, particularly around the two issues of uh, impact related to climate change and the impact related to upstream, downstream, particularly upstream, or I guess downstream, where the fracking issue is, does that change the comments that you're going to be making, or are you recommending we make no changes to those comments in a report that have to be in Monday? No, the three of you, Mr. Chair, if they're those are the issues we're going to uh, acknowledge and say they should be included, plus the climate change question, okay? And the other interrogatories that, that are listed in the report as Alvin went through them. So you're not, you're, you're not suggesting then that we take the, the two requirements that the Conservation Authority approved last night and plug them into the documents that are going forward on Tuesday? In, in, my, in our view, that's already covered by, uh, by the interrogatories and concerns raised by uh, our natural heritage planner. If you wish more specificity to that, if you like the way it was worded in, in the uh, HCA document, we can use that wording if you prefer. So, mm -hmm. you, uh, I think Alvin has to uh, Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Ferguson. The two items that were presented at the Hamilton Conservation Authority meeting are uh, items 1B of the procedural order. That's what the um, OEB is asking us to confirm. Um, so last night, in essence, the Hamilton Conservation Authority was affirming uh, their position on the procedural order. We are of the similar opinion, again, affirming those exact two same items as contained in the procedural order today. Well, they're already in your recommendations then? Correct. Okay, it shortens up my questions a lot that you're, because the intervener status is what I want to spend some time on. But it looks like, Mr. Chair, that's going to be deferred. And so uh, I'd like to just read the final one, but uh, it sounds if you're connecting into those two conditions the Conservation Authority had anyway, that uh, maybe we're good to go. But uh, I'll sit and listen to my other colleagues. We can have the final read uh, when we exhaust our speakers list before we vote. Uh, Councillor Partridge just stepped out. Uh, Councillor Nan. Thank you through the deputy mayor no questions i just wanted to say thank you to the staff who prepared the report that's before us um, and then a clarifying procedural question so we are voting on the recommendation uh, at this gic or at council is it are we voting it here and then ratifying it at the special council behind us through you mr deputy mayor yes you're going to ratify it here or a vote on, it, vote here, on it here and then immediately following this we'll have a special council where you ratify it absolutely yeah, excellent uh, yep, again, just thank you to the staff. I think they've been really um, uh, thorough in, in the presentation and uh, due diligence on the issues. So looking forward to supporting it. Councillor Clark. Thank you, and, and our discussion back and forth in the staff report is making short thrift of the, the motion that uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Jackson and I uh, drafted, but we appreciate the assistance. Um, so the, the two areas that are outstanding that I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on how we in, in make the recommendations as a council to, to the OEB that are not captured, at least from what I could see in the report. Um, I have it worded here, requesting the Ontario Energy Board to require an ecological study 
and an independent peer review of the proposal to be funded by the proponent prior to any decision to grant leave to construct. And I didn't see that captured in language from this. We danced around it, but it's not that specific. And I, I know it may be a long shot, but as environmental leaders and, and leaders in our community, I think it's important that we say to them, this is how we do business and we're expecting them to do the same thing. Not asking for all of the other studies, geotechnical that we would normally do in environmental assessment, specific to natural heritage, it's the ecological study that, that we were concerned at, at the Conservation Authority. And I'd like to hear staff's comments on that, if we could include that somehow in, in our response to the OEB here. So through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Clark, um, in, the, in the case of the staff report, it was uh, addressed through interrogatories. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, did staff support the inclusion of that particular issue that you just addressed uh, as, as worded as well? Because it, it, it's the same thing in essence, it's just in a different format okay. and more specific. So I suggest you move that separately to be added to the staff report? I, I think so at the appropriate time. And so then, then the other one that's on the only other one that is outstanding that the HCA had, had dealt with was the request for an oral hearing to ensure a fully transparent public process. And again, it's not we don't make that decision. The OAB is going to make that decision. Um, and I'm looking to see downside upside to, to the municipality saying um, this is what we, we would like the OAB to consider. And I think that's probably more of a legal question. Um, so through the chair, if committee slash council is interested in an oral hearing, uh, this would be a good mechanism to express that intention because you may not get another opportunity before they make that decision. Yep. And, and I think that's the challenge. So those are the two items, I guess, um, I look to my, my seconder, Councillor Jackson, that, that are left out of our long worded motion would be request the OAB to require an ecological study and an independent peer review of a proposal to be, of the proposal to be funded by the proponent prior to any decision to grant leave to construct. And then the other one would be to request an oral hearing to ensure fully transparent public process. Yeah, okay. So those would be our amendments to it. And I scratched out, sorry, Madam Clerk, everything that's scratched out, that don't do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we have no further speakers that are currently in chambers, uh, so if you want to put that on the floor now, we can vote on that. So, Mr. Chair, just before you, um, I just had a further thought, and if uh, you're interested in oral hearing, you might want to specify that it be located in Hamilton as opposed to, for example, Toronto, because that would improve, uh, improve the local accessibility for uh, the local popu uh, population and for staff that would have to attend that hearing. you. Uh, so I just, uh, just to be clear, it would, not, not, the amendment would read, um, request the OAB to require an ecological study and an independent peer review of the proposal to be funded by the proponent prior to any decision to grant leave to construct, and then B, or Madam Clerk can number them accordingly, request uh, oral hearings in Hamilton to ensure fully transparent public process. And that would be in addition to the amended B that, um, I was going to say Councillor Paparella, <laughs> Guy Paparella put for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor, uh, no further amendment. amendment. Amendment on the floor, moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Jackson. All in favour? you and then the main motion would you like to read that one more time Council, uh, madam clerk <laughs> the other councillor Paparella. Um, I'm actually working on it as we speak because I don't have a lot of this so what it's essentially going to do is and you're going to see it in the report that I have to flip over between you'll print this for council yes 
Yeah, in five minutes, yes. The subsection A to report PED 20053 respecting the Enbridge Gas Inc.'s leave to construct application for the 2021 Don to Parkway extension and integrated resource planning proposal be deferred to the February 19, 2020 GIC. And that subsection B to report, same report, same subject matter, be deleted and replaced. And it's going to have to include the motion that Councillor Clark just read out, but that in response to the Ontario and Ontario Energy Board's procedural order number one dated January 30th, 2020, the general manager of planning and economic development be authorized and directed to file written submissions on behalf of the city that are consistent with the issues outlined in report PED 20053. So the recommendation as amended, moved by Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Clark. All in favor. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Vanderbeek, seconded by Councillor Ferguson. All in favor? Carry. Carry. Don't go anywhere. I could maybe have 15 minutes, 15 minutes. I'll try for 10, but let's say, let's say 10 and then we can start in 15. How about that?